up to the stage, Professor Doug Street. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, so today's theme, we all know, uh, is minimal. Uh, I know we're all in a hurry. Uh, I have written a talk uh, that I think really exemplifies minimal to the extreme sort of degree. So thank you very much. <laughs> right. Are there questions? Okay. Actually, we're going to talk a little bit about science. I'm a scientist. I um, did some science through school. I still do a bit of science. And what science scientists do is they use the scientific method. And most of us know a bit about the scientific method, um, going all the way back as far as elementary school. And most of us know that if you're a very serious scientist, you know, one that wears goggles, one that stands in front of periodic tables, uh, that you're going to apply the scientific method to most parts of your life. And so what we're going to do is apply that uh, to minimal today. So in the inductive branch of the scientific method, we start with an observation. And let's look at some observations here in America around, let's just say, stuff. So there was a study done at uh, UCLA of 32 families. They went into their homes, which is a difficult thing to do in the United States. Convinced 32 families to let them go into their homes and count visible stuff. And one of the very typical homes, they found that in just two bedrooms in the living area, there were 2,352 items visible. All right, so let's talk about the idea of home. In 1950, average American home, 983 square feet or so. A fairly tiny home that we might say today. Today, in 2011, according to the U.S. Census, somewhere around 2,500 square feet. More stuff, more space, a little bit less minimal. And then if you were going to look at one of our favorite things, right, shoes. Average man, according to a study in Time magazine, 12 pairs of shoes. Average woman, 27, of which about five were used at uh, any one time. So I know most of you are thinking that, yeah, you're probably going to have to force me into a dumpster uh, to get uh, you know, much lower than that. All right, so uh, what I want to do now is move into the next step of this scientific method approach at minimal, and we ask some sort of research question. And the research question that I want to ask here is what does one really need to have a pretty good life? Right? How much does one need to have a good life? And what you generally do is you take that research question, you spin it into some sort of statement and so that we call a hypothesis. And my hypothesis here is going to be that one can have a pretty good life on less. And one might be able to have a pretty good life on a lot less. So we've established this hypothesis, and now we want to run a couple of experiments. And I'm going to talk about these experiments sort of in the form of studies. We're going to gather some data points here. And the first one of these experiments started about 15 years ago, and it took place mostly out in the desert. It actually started uh, in Silicon Valley. I was a young project manager at a very large corporation there. Things were really moving. Those of you guys that remember the late 90s, things were booming, right? It was six years after Mosaic came along up until when there was a little problem, March 10th, 2000, the NASDAQ had actually doubled. Things were screaming along at a very fast pace. But I had sort of some sort of feeling that something might be wrong. It might have been something wrong with myself. It might have been something wrong with the general kind of consumption at that point. So one day, I went into my boss's office and said, you know what, I'm going to take a little time off and head out into the desert. He said, um, OK. Uh, I went and rented a car at the San Jose airport, started driving south down Highway 5, and found myself uh, out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Had all of my clothes at that point. We'll get to another clothes story in a minute. Um, began to sort of lose things, you might say. And at one point, uh, you know, after observing all of this in the desert, that only really the minimal flourish. Right? There's not a lot of additional water. There's not a lot of additional food out there. But things seem pretty happy going back to that original kind of hypothesis and research question. 
So uh, what I did was uh, at one point after losing some of my things, I said, okay, what is the most important thing to me? What is the most important material object that I own that I cherish the most? What is my you know, precious? And my precious, me precious at that point, was a Rolex watch. And what I did was I buried that Rolex out there in the sand and I made a commitment that I wasn't coming back for this Rolex till I sort of no longer needed it or wanted it. I went back then, ended up leaving that job, and as many of us do uh, in this room, had a transition into the very serious life of academia at that point. Experiment number two, flash forward about 15 years or so. It's 2013, and this is a travel experiment. It actually started off when uh, I did what many of us in this room have done. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. Uh, but I set up an online dating account. Didn't have a whole lot of luck, right? Sent a lot of messages out, probably got blocked a few times, <laughs> not a whole lot of replies. Went on one date with this nice librarian to the Horseshoe Lounge. She ends up telling me very early on in the conversation that her thing is to collect beard hair in jars. <laughs> and of course, I asked if they were tiny mason jars or large ones because I was in a minimal sort of state as my uh, facial hair. This is about as far as I can go with that. But then I got really lucky. Uh, I got a message one day from this person, and at the beginning of the message, it said something like this, Diogenes is probably my favorite Greek dude. What a troublemaker. I have to admire anybody who is willing to live in an oversized jar. I, I didn't read anything else after that. <laughs> like, this is fate. This is unprompted, right? So. I went on from there and I said, okay, you know, this is going somewhere. I got her real name eventually. Added her on Facebook, good sign. Things are still moving along. She accepts my friend request. And then three weeks later, I said, well, let me do what all typical guys do if they really want to woo a lady that you really don't know all that well. You ask them, hey, you want to go on a road trip just solo, one on one? She said, uh, you know, okay, maybe, you know, where are we going? I said, oh, I was thinking of this great road trip. It's not to Big Bend this summer, but it's from Tbilisi, Georgia, all the way through the Balkans. I did not get a very prompt response. In fact, I thought this may have been another one of those you've been blocked kind of scenarios. Eventually she said, okay, I'm game. I'm going to take a little risk. Well, that wasn't obviously far enough. So then I sent her this text message a few weeks before we were about to leave that basically said, hey, you know, um, I'm kind of thinking that we got too much stuff and I've got too much stuff, that camera thing that I was going to take, actually the backpack and actually the bag. Actually, I think I'm just going to go uh, on this trip with what I'm wearing and, you know, maybe stuff a passport and an iPhone charger in my pocket as well. You know, how does that sound? Is that a much longer delay before I receive any kind of response. And then you know what? She said, uh, I'll do it. <laughs> so about three weeks later, we take this picture on the morning we're going to leave Houston International Airport to fly into Turkey, and then three weeks out of that, out of London. And this is all we've got for the whole trip. Yes, we did shower. Right? And, you know, yes, we did have to wash clothes every couple of days. So, we did it. Uh, there's a picture of us on the left um, in our sort of minimal outfit. And you'll notice all these pictures, if you can make them out, from Athens, Sarajevo, Scotland, Cambridge, all the way across. We, are, uh, we, we haven't changed clothes. Now, there was a very subtle one. She insisted on get, bringing some sort of designer shoes on the trip. And our second day in Istanbul, it was a very much of a I told you, you know, so sort of thing where we went uh, and bought some new sandals uh, to, to replace the designer shoes. But they were very nice for the first couple days. 
So uh, she's a writer. I said, hey, we're back. It'd be really cool to write that up. Somebody might be interested. Oh, I don't know. Write it up. She did. It went into Salon. It did very well. And then very recently, we just got news that it's probably going to be actually turned into a Hollywood film. <laughs> so, you know, talk about minimal. When you think about Hollywood, you think minimal, right? You go right there. Experiment number three, the home experiment. This started, uh, I'll say back in 2011, but it really started probably going all the way back to this desert experience. In 2011, I lived in a 3,000 square foot house. It had four bedrooms, it had four and a half baths, nice long leaf pine, nice red front door with a mailbox. Um, three of us in the house. A bit after that, I went off and there were two in that house and me moving into an apartment. And in my apartment, I brought quite a few things. And one day, I just decided that, hey, might not even need all of this stuff. I'm going to put an ad on Facebook and announce to all of my students that at 6 o'clock, I'm going to be selling everything for a dollar. And I had to clarify per item. Students are pretty quick to move on these sort of things, so by seven this is basically what I was dealing with. Really, about an hour. So, I'm all packed up with my one suitcase full of stuff, living in my office at that point, got rid of the apartment, illegally, right, you know, chocolate goes a long way with the maintenance and security people generally. And uh, I'm sitting in my hometown, Thanksgiving in 2012, and um, I say, okay, you know, I want to mix up what I'm doing in academia a bit. I'm there editing a journal manuscript, and you know, I've been showing inconvenient truth and putting my students to sleep for years at this point. I've been showing the story of stuff. You know, what can we do to shake up the boat just a little bit? I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I didn't immediately connect it, but I looked out into the parking lot. And I realized right then that I had some new uh, plans. And notice that I didn't say I looked beyond the parking lot to the neighborhood of houses beyond there. I looked actually into the parking lot where I saw a 10 cubic yard dumpster, the exact home that I made my home this February, February 4th indeed. If there's any Doctor Who fans, do you get it? Bigger on the inside, the TARDIS. Uh, you getting it? OK. And we'll go out there and pay that a visit in a bit. So this was my first night in the dumpster. Throw down a little cardboard. We've got our sleeping bag. We're basically in Big Bend, but not in Big Bend. We do have a walk-in closet. There's the kitchen, the living room, the dining room, the extra bathroom, the master bath. Uh, it's all in there. And this was a few nights ago. You know, one of the nice things about living in a dumpster is you actually can have quite a nice sunlight. Yeah, you can have a a nice sunlight, which actually ends up being sort of the whole roof and watch the ecliptic or feel the rain slightly sort of on your face and sometimes more than slightly. So let's go into uh, analysis. We've collected some data, we've run some experiments, and I'm going to talk about analysis around minimal for just what was gained and what was lost. So what was lost? Well, obviously I lost my job, right, in this first experiment. Um, a lot of people lost their job in March of 2000, so that made me feel a little bit better. Um, I lost some nice stuff, right? That went out into the desert, maybe never to be seen again. And, you know, one of the things that was very difficult to deal with was that I lost a lot of status. So I was looking for people that I used to work with that had a lot of status here. And something very interesting. I googled status symbol as well to see what might be a symbol of status and I, crap you not, uh, the very first thing that comes back on Google Images when you Google image status is that. <laughs> so it was a double whammy, I lost twice. What did I gain from that desert experience? Well, I mean, this was a much more sort of metaphorical, metaphysical type of gain. I think it really was the first step in setting me in a new direction, right, that things didn't have to go through that lockstep. 
of I'm going to finish up at IBM a few years, go get a, you know, maybe job back in consulting, go get the MBA and kind of lockstep through that to eventually ending in Mecca of being CEO of some big corporation. And it gave me the idea that maybe you can jump off the train and other things can come your way. So on the trip, right? Certainty, and I'm not talking about certainty in the relationship here, right? One of the things that was lost in certainty is where we were going to go, right? There were no reservations, and we had no backup in terms of a backpack or extra clothes, these sort of things. So this is a map I drew when we got from Istanbul to Athens, and you'll see there's a question mark there. You know, we know we've got to leave London in a couple of weeks, but we really know nothing else. No change of clothes. This picture was actually taken in Istanbul as well. One of my friends there you know, realized that I didn't have any bags. Uh, he asked me to sort of be his porter slash Sherpa for the very long trip to the bus station uh, with his two bags. And then you also have the opportunity, and this is what people really fear without reservations, is that you're going to lose sight. You're not going to see the sights, right? You expect to see the Eiffel Tower, right, when you go to Paris. You expect to see Big Ben when you go to London. And when you go to Peru, uh, you expect to see Machu Picchu. And sometimes that can cause issues. I mean, you might notice uh, Clara a little bit teary-eyed there. If you are really into relics and you go and, and ruins and you go to South America, the one thing you want to see is uh, Machu Picchu. And when the people in front of you buy the last two tickets to Machu Picchu because you didn't plan in advance, well then that can lead to a loss. So what do we gain? Well, we gained quite a bit of freedom. We ended up in entire new cities, entire new countries that we didn't think we would. And I put that same map on there because at Athens, our sort of loose plan was to go to Sarajevo and then to sort of the western part of the Balkans. Well, we didn't have any tickets. We walk into the bus station. We said, we want to go tomorrow to Sarajevo. And they said, oh, you can't go for a couple of weeks. It's all booked up. Oops. So we said, where else can we go? And they said, well, there's a ticket tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. to Budapest, four or 500 miles out of the way, but we'll take it and we'll hitchhike or do something to get back in the general direction. And, you know, sometimes on these, I, I'm not going to recommend this, guys, to go through this sort of, I, I wouldn't say that this is like a normal sort of process of how a relationship works out, but as of uh, right before this talk, at least, uh, we were still together. So, right before the crying picture, right? Um, so, let me talk about this third experiment and sort of the analysis on that. First off, it was very easy to walk out my front door in the morning in my nice 3,000 square foot house and a red door. My first few experiences trying to walk out my front door, <laughs> and that is real. That is the first time I ever tried to get out of a dumpster. Watch the toe, if any of you guys get in. <laughs> My marble kitchen with an island and a nice range, right? A microwave has become a five gallon bucket and a camp stove where I basically cook Turkish coffee and live off of that. What else was lost? Well, many people ask this question. In the camping phase, I have to sort of do extraordinary things to use the toilet. You know, right now, sometimes that involves uh, running across the campus in the middle of the night. Uh, the toilet facilities uh, are all really not there anymore. <laughs> all right, but what have I got? Well, I've got a really cool water source now and a really cool tool called the water, water hippo roller, which was brought in from South Africa. I bring my water up from Town Lake all the way up Chacon, filter it, and we drink it. Uh, I've got a water catchment uh, sort of system that I'm still perfecting on my roof. But <laughs> some of that, you can see behind it, spills into my garden that is literally four steps out my front door. Um, I have some new transportation that's made from old bikes with some friends over at Yellow Bike. 
Um, however, I don't really even need to use my bike. My commute to work is one and a half to two minutes, depending on traffic, right, between here and the dumpster uh, and weather conditions. And also, we've had some really cool interactions with uh, different sorts of friends, right? So different sorts of people interested in the dumpster project who sometimes make us things, including the giant fish cockroach uh, that is attacking the dumpster that seems to be electrified or something. <laughs> the other thing that's really cool about tossing out some of the sort of preconceptions and getting a little bit more freedom is we can really think big and out of the box, sorry, no pun intended, um, about what we want to do is sort of the ultimate home and garden, right? So a dumpster that telescopes up with solar panels, with a nice sleeping loft, with a, uh, you know, balcony and a shower, even with some stairs that double as monkey bars, right? If you're going to live in a dumpster, monkey bars are a, a good idea. So we've been through observation question. We've, you know, made this hypothesis that perhaps you can have a pretty good life with much, much less. We've conducted three experiments, and we've done a little bit of analysis on this. And so what I want to talk about now is our results findings, right? That's what you want to share. And first off, this might sound like a Tony Robbins, you know, sort of line, or uh, a very cheesy motivational, or maybe even van down by the river, right, kind of talk. Um, but you know, my life has been better each week. I mean, I really have been happier. I've felt like I have more freedom. I felt like I have more friends around the city, that my living room has really expanded to be the whole city of Austin, right? And my restaurants, well, we'll call them restaurants, places like the Yellow Jacket and the Horseshoe. Um, every week has been better. And I think some of those early experiments laid that foundation in minimal. And then this dumpster all in sort of thing, I've felt that every single week. Now one thing I want to come back to, because when you talk about your results, you have to say what might be wrong with them. And there are data points, and then there are outliers, right? All three of these experiments are really sort of outliers. I mean, how many people are going to be nuts enough to move into a large trash can? Did I say guts or nuts? Nuts. And how many people are going to go, you know, digging around in the desert like a cat and burying, you know, status symbols, right? These things are all a little strange and outliers. But if you put together those outliers and all the data points, things we've heard as we've been doing this dumpster project, things like, I remember when I went off to college, right, and I had one backpack of stuff, I felt so free at that point even for people a little bit later on. I've got an empty nest, we sold the house, we got an RV, and we've never felt more free and more happy. All right? So even those normal data points, I think it sort of spells out to some sort of formula. Right? And this is not all encompassing, but it's something that I'll just sort of leave you with. And that is more minimal, right? and these experiments in our own lives, produces and has the potential to produce more freedom. And then the end part of this equation is that more freedom equals more moments. And so we haven't talked about moments. We haven't talked about what that means. But the way I think about a moment is when they say your life flashes before you, right, at the very end, it's those things that flash before you. So these are very individual, and sometimes they're just weird moments. You know, sometimes they're epic things, but a lot of times they're really weird. So an epic one that somebody told me this morning was when they realized life was impermanent when they looked upon the iceberg graveyard in Antarctica. Okay? Kind of an outlier probably for most of us in several ways. You know, for me, one of them was my grandma taking me to episode four when I was six years old in the theater for the first time, right? For another friend, she said it was when her brother came home from the hospital for the first time she touched his arm. Those are moments. And my argument is that the less stuff and the more minimal we are, it gives them the, us the freedom to 
experience those moments. And I'll give you one other example of a moment. A moment could be when you have your friends drop you off at the Greyhound bus station, let's say, in Los Angeles. And you take a three-hour bus ride out a little bit further east. You get off in Barstow. You hitchhike a little bit further out. You wander out into what appears to be kind of the middle of nowhere. And you find a place of some triangles in the sand. They're slightly covered over, right? And you reach down into that sand. You reach down into it. It's hot sand, you feel something sort of cool, and you pull your hand up and shake it, and it's a watch that you buried three years before. That's a moment. Thank you.